All right, hello, welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I just want to go ahead and give a disclaimer to anyone listening. Uh, I mentioned it, I think, two weeks ago, but I didn't get, I didn't give a follow up last week. That I'm in the process of getting a new space for the show. That went through. Everything's going good. I'm actually working through some construction stuff to get that set up. We're testing the internet. I'm not sure how that's going to work today. Skype was being pretty weird whenever we first set it up. Uh, so I might have to look into that in the coming weeks. So I apologize in advance if you hear any sound things. I also don't have my mic or anything set up until I get the new room basically set up. I'm trying to do it as fast as possible, maybe maybe in a week or two. Definitely will have my mic back and everything here next week. So uh, if it sounds bad, I apologize, but we're going to go ahead and jump in. And I wanted to fill everyone in since I forgot to mention it last week. Today... I'm uh, going to go ahead and try to keep an eye on the baseball games going on. The play in baseball, we'll go ahead and touch that a little bit before we get into high tempo. I wasn't a fan of the wild card game at first, whenever they expanded it two, three years ago now, but I'm starting to come around because this year you have a team like the Twins that everyone had pretty much counted out. They're able to play, potentially knock out the Yankees here, and I think that's going to go ahead and expand baseball, at least the fan base, as the ratings haven't dropped too much. I looked into it a little bit. I mentioned it last week, which reminds me, I've been getting messages to talk about political stuff. I, I think we had some comments and stuff. That's not the point of the show. Sports is supposed to be fun, entertaining for me, and I'm keeping politics out of it. So if you don't want that, whatever, if you want us to touch on it, you'll have to find a new show because we're not going to mention it. So if you want to keep sending me messages or whatever, that's fine. You can talk trash on me, but there's no place for it in our show. Uh, just to bring that up because I know I was going to mention it last week. We had someone message, and I think during the live show on Periscope, and then I got a couple messages after the fact. But the baseball playoffs starting, I don't know if you guys got a chance to look at the bracket, uh, but I'll let you guys feed in. What are your thoughts on the Major League Baseball playoffs this year. You can go ahead and kick it off, Rick. It's going to be a lot of teams, and I, like I said last week, there's a lot of big market teams that are facing each other. I'm looking actually right now at my cell phone out of the bracket. I mean, it sets up a little bit easier for teams like uh, Cleveland in a way because these two teams are going to be using a bunch of pitchers in this game. I think uh, Minnesota's on their first. I think Yankees are already on their second. It's a 3-3 score last year last I looked over. So yeah. but I do want to tell you that. So I think a lot of pitchers are going to get used in this game. I think one thing to watch out for if Boston exits quickly, don't be surprised if John Farrell is not renewed a contract or let go of his contract if Houston pulls it up. So and I think it's one thing that talks about especially the youth of baseball right now. Houston, a bunch of younger guys playing. You have the Dodgers who are have led by Cody Bellinger with his bat, and then the Cubs, which we already know, guys like Rizzo and Bryant going crazy there too. So um, I'm looking for – I think the Yankees are still going to win this game. Um, and also tomorrow, I think Zach Greinke pitching for the Diamondbacks is going to be a key for them. So, But if I will say this, I kind of already did my postseason bracket challenge. Uh, it's the same as last year. It's Indians versus Chicago, and I have Indians winning this whole thing. So they're my pick to win. Matt, what are your thoughts on the playoffs this year? Well, disappointed. Wanted to see St. Louis finish out strong, ended out nine games, nine games back. So well, I'm, I guess at this point I'm just looking to pull for Verlander because he's one of my favorite players, and even though he's – He's he's with Houston now, right? Yes. Yeah. So with him, so with him being in Houston now, I guess that's who I'll go with. Since obviously Detroit's not in it, St. Louis isn't in it. We'll just we'll just keep going by player by player. Then I guess until baseball. Yeah, I'll be. I was kind of surprised that the Detroit didn't make a better run this year. And they basically traded guys like Verlander away to contenders. So they're basically in the middle of the re rebuild. I'm not sure what to think of the Pirates. They've, I, I saw a tweet sent out. I think actually Jeff 
might have sent it to Southbound Sports. I'll look and retweet it where the bulk of the Pirates roster from their playoff run two, three years ago already are in the playoffs. So the guys they went ahead and, and threw out or traded or whatever they did, they're actually playing in the postseason once again. And the Pirates are at home. So it's very disappointing. I'm not sure. They need basically a, cult, a culture change. And I'm not sure if current ownership is going to be able to do that. I would like to see the Pirates in the playoffs. But I'm not – like looking at the way they finished, I don't have any confidence for next year. So on um, the play, playoffs, I my big prediction is I think the Indians are going to burn – or have already burnt themselves out. They went on the big win streak. Normally whenever that happens, baseball is a game uh, of streaks. If you get hot at the right time, like uh, the Royals did a few years ago, I think when I think they won the World Series, if I'm not mistaken. They got hot. Tampa Bay got hot the one year, almost won the World Series. They got hot a little bit too early. That's what I saw from the Indians. I actually saw the official, because my brother's an Indians fan, but he sent me something from the official Indians uh, account where they were like kind of feeling they must have felt the pressure because they were sending out tweets and, and writing articles about how the win streak didn't come too early. Because I've been nagging my brother, like, hey, at least you got those 20-something wins. At least you got the record. Because they're not going to win the World Series this year. So I think they're not going to make it from the AL. I don't know. And like you mentioned, Rick, if Boston gets bounced early, I could see them making some big roster moves because they have a lot invested and a lot of veteran guys. And they're kind of in a position to... I don't want to say rebuild because them and the Yankees kind of just reload on free agents, but they have to do something to cut some room on the contracts. And I don't know what's going to happen. But it should be another exciting year. I think baseball playoffs have been uh, getting pretty much up there in television ratings. I think I mentioned it earlier before I went off on another tangent. But the ratings themselves, they're pretty high for the World Series. I want to say when I looked at them doing the research that – they were around the same as the NBA playoffs, if not better, last year. So as a sport as a whole, they don't touch the NFL. But for a professional sports league, the World Series is still a top must-watch TV, even though they they kind of quit promoting it the past couple of years. I think when everything went digital, they thought, hey, well, we'll just keep doing what we've, what we've been doing. And so it's good to see the – League finally get behind digital. I know they've been doing a bunch of free games on Yahoo.com. If you're not familiar or not aware of that, if you go to Yahoo Sports, you can watch free baseball games throughout the year. I want to say Facebook and Twitter looked into it. I don't know if they finalized that or not. And just a heads up on the NFL, NFL is doing the same exact thing. I actually didn't see, I couldn't find the Bears-Packers game on Thursday night. Because it was one of those weird, wasn't on TV. It was like, I, I forget where it was broadcast. Maybe it was on CBS. I just didn't have my antenna set up yet. But that game was also broadcast on Amazon Prime. So you could stream that to your tablet, to your phone, if you're an Amazon Prime customer. So make sure make sure that you know that or you're aware of that. Tell your friends. Because that's the way you're going to be able to watch free football in the future if you already have some of these other services. If you have a Twitter account. Twitter's been doing college football and things like that. Uh, but that's kind of a public service announcement. Make sure you're looking at digital because some of these games, they might not be on regular television, but there's still other ways you can watch them. And we'll go ahead and I'll use that to segue into the NFL talk for this week. Uh, but real quick, do you guys have anything for any final thoughts on Major League Baseball, Rick? If you're a Pirate fan, get ready. Your postseason already started, and October got canceled again this year. Congratulations. Um, but uh, you got a general general manager for four years. You got a manager for four years. And you may not have a center fielder for a couple more weeks if what happens at the winter meetings. So if your team isn't playing right now, wait until the winter meetings in December and wait for some guys to get shipped around here for teams that need them. So if the Red Sox do get balanced early, don't be surprised if they start jumping in some of these markets to trade for a Stanton or a McCutcheon or something like that. 
because it looks McCutcheon got his curtain call, so did Stanton. I'm betting these two are both gone somehow in the winter meeting. So we'll wait and see. And the Marlins fired the whole front office, so who knows who Derek Jeter is probably going to bring in. Probably Jorge Posada, maybe the general manager, and watch a bunch of other Yankee legends reappear out of nowhere in that front office, too. Yeah, I saw that, and I thought that was a coward move on his part. He actually had someone else go in and tell the people they were fired because he didn't want to do it. And I think if you're taking over a team, they really don't know you anyway besides your public persona. I, I mean, maybe he's met them as he's been taken over the franchise, but man up. Tell them yourself. I, I don't know what they were paid or what positions got cut on the front office, but I would assume the front office people are pretty well off financially. So he, he could be a gentleman about it and just tell them, hey, we're moving in a new direction. It's not that hard. Matt, any final thoughts on you for baseball? No, Rick kind of hit on it for me already of kind of seeing who what players are going to be moved around because I thought – at the trade deadline, they really started to – the Stanton talks went out, and a lot of those other Marlins outfielders were possibly suspect to trades. And I'm curious to see if they actually do end up moving those guys or if they end up just staying home and they're eating those contracts. Yeah, that's a big thing. I, I think the last thing I read was they're not sure on Stanton. They're, gonna, they're looking into it, the contract situation, and everything else is going on. Uh, but – before we get into the NFL, I also forgot we didn't go high tempo this week. Uh, I'll kick it off. My thing, my man Mike Leach, big win on Saturday. I've been saying it all year. USC, they have the talent. They don't have the coaching. Mike Leach went in there, and when it was at home, he got uh, took care of business. Now, I'm a little worried because their first five games were at home, and I think five of their last seven are on the road. They start this week going into Oregon. I really like Mike Leach. I think you got a raw deal in Texas Tech down there with the uh, – it was one of those media hype situations where ESPN pushed an agenda, got him resigned for no reason. He's, I think he's still fighting it in court to try to get his last paycheck. I would like to see that happen. Texas Tech needs to do the right thing and take care of that because they had circumstantial evidence. They went with the media hype, the media pressure, and he got pushed out. Washington State's a better football program right now than Texas Tech. Mike Leach is a better coach than what Texas Tech has. And so it's very good uh, to see him take a program like Washington State, one that was in the gutter, elevate them to a 5-0. I think they're 4-0 right now, uh, I think. And they are near the top 10. I think they're 12, somewhere in there, 12, 14. So uh, good to see that, and I'm excited for some of the games they have out there at West because the Pac-12 plays at night. So it's good to have a nice, put the kids to bed. You can relax, watch some Mike Leach football. They have a pretty solid defense this year. They usually play like 10. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, but that's one of the things that I saw. Uh, what do you guys want to go on? Matt, you can kick this one off. Well, uh, I saw today that Warwick Dunn was being inducted into the Atlanta Falcons ring of honor. So I like seeing those Florida state running backs. And also I caught this random one of, uh, oh, I'm trying to think his name. Dave Jr. is now playing up in Canada and is, is doing really, is playing really well for Toronto. Who is that? I had you one week after there. rushing for the fourth high, James, James Wilder Jr. Okay. Yeah. Wilder. I'm so, one of, he shared a backfield with Devontae Freeman. He's yep. up in Toronto now. And he, uh, a week after rushing for the fourth highest total in franchise history, he added another 141 versus Montreal. So he's playing well up in, up in Canada as well. So not just in the NFL, but in the Canadian leagues, running backs getting it done for the Seminoles. I'm surprised that he didn't pick, uh, get taken on like a Darren Sproles type role where he's kind of a scat back because I thought he was that type of player at Florida State. Um, but it's good to hear him having some success. And before I get to Rick, what do you think of the Dalvin Cook injury? Because he was looking pretty good. That uh, On both fronts. I also picked my fantasy drafts, and that hurt my not only my fantasy team, but also it stinks to see the media really tried to portray him as a bad guy. But, I, you know, it, it was interesting to see – once the games actually started and they 
they got to see what he does on the field and not just judge him on what they perceive his character to be, that he is a good football player. Yeah, he looked really good. I thought he had a chance to be rookie of the year. It's very sad whenever it's – I don't know if it was a complete tear, but it was almost complete if it wasn't, and that's usually uh, not too good. Hopefully it was a, a clean tear and it can heal properly. Uh, but, Rick, we'll go ahead and let you go high tempo here before we get into some more NFL talk. What are your thoughts? I'm actually going to go right into the NFL actually right now. That The 4-0 and team that is left is probably nobody had, not even many people in Vegas was the Kansas City Chiefs. And then I'm looking at their division, and the one thing that comes out to my mind is never so good. Carr's injured. Who knows what happens? They they pretty much – I watched part of the game, and when it wasn't – Carr wasn't in, it looked like a, you know, your fourth-grade team pro, like, book, like, playbook. It was just too simple, and they figured it out quickly. And I will say if the uh, Raiders rely on manual – Good luck to them. And the saddest part of all is still the Chargers are still an NFL football team, even though the Eagles on the other side of the coast outdraw you at your home stadium. There were more Eagle fans than Charger fans at your home stadium, which is across three time zones. Congratulations, Charger fans. You still have an NFL team if you knew that. Or one, two. Or wanted to take a drive from San Diego to Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles to see him playing an MLS soccer stadium. There is one side. Well, it's good that you, it's good that you brought that up. I that was my actual first thing that I was going to talk about on the um, the game itself for the NFL. I mean, for the Chargers. So. I was looking at it. It wasn't just the Eagles. Every team has been outdrawing them. The a crazy thing with the Eagles themselves, as I get my, my notes here, you threw me off, Rick. The Eagles, a lot of their purchases, I think I saw somewhere that it said 60 to 70% of the tickets sold to Eagles fans were actually sold in the Philadelphia market to people with Philadelphia addresses. So it wasn't like a normal, okay, people relocated there. You see it a lot with colleges. Uh, a team like, like let's say, a, a school like Penn State or Michigan that pulls out a ton of alumni, they go ahead and move out west, maybe to Arizona or whatever. Penn State, maybe they're, they're down south. They play a game down south. They sell a, a good bit of tickets. The NFL is not really like that. I, I, I understand that cities go ahead and people graduate from college or whatever and move out. But the LA experiment is a complete mess. It's not only them. The Ram Stadium's half empty. I've noticed it with Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay Stadium has been half empty. I don't know if that's due to the hurricane, so I don't want to throw um, shade at them because I think someone actually came at me on Twitter and was like saying something to that effect. So I'll keep an eye on them. But L.A., there's no reason. Every team is in drawing. And every – I think I've seen economists or whoever, whoever does those charts, they put it out there and warn the NFL that people aren't going to attend the games. It doesn't matter what franchise is at doesn't matter if you put three franchises. It's not going to go ahead and be a thing because the traffic and the public transportation just isn't there to go to these games. It's just not. And there's so many other things you can do to go and – like if you're going to fly to L.A., I have a hard time believing you're going to go to just watch a football team. Philadelphia proved me wrong, but that's not going to happen every year. I would assume that's like a one-year thing. People may want to check out the soccer game. Was there a back-to-back? I don't know. I'm assuming – I know soccer's in season. So maybe fans were like, hey, we'll fly out, uh, catch the Eagles on Sunday. Maybe we'll catch something else on Saturday. Maybe something else was going on that was big that was going to draw them out there. But it's interesting to see that they've been pushing these L.A. teams and teams to move. My prediction, I, I've never mentioned on the show, I don't think, but I told you guys, I assume that they're going to start moving franchises like the Chargers to cities in other countries. It's the only way they can expand any further. If the ratings are really going to drop, we mentioned it last week, there's theories going out there due to politics, due to the protests and everything. Maybe it's just because they've reached the max peak. And I mentioned it earlier on this show. Now you can watch games on Amazon Prime. 
So now you don't even have to already have some type of television and they don't account for these metrics. I saw someone asking the Nelson or Nielsen, however you pronounce it, television guys, they've started to give estimates. So like the big TV providers were like, hey, can you estimate how many people have been watching at bars? So it inflated the numbers for the NFL this week. That's the craziest thing I've seen. And then I'll let you guys talk. They asked the rating people to add people who watched in bars their best guess. How the hell would they know how many people are at the bars? And my follow-up is that 10 years ago, did they not think people were still watching the games at bars? I mean, they didn't count them 10 years ago. Why are they going to start estimating them now and then say, look, our numbers are 1% better? That's what I saw that was put out. They were like, if you, if you take these new estimates, we're 1% ahead of last year. No, you're not. You just took a guess of how many people are watching it at a bar. I was in college 10 years ago or whatever. We went out every time there was a game on Thursday night, on Sunday night, and on Monday night to the bar to watch the game. I, have a high, I highly doubt that I was the only one to do that. So 10 years ago, those same people at the bar weren't getting counted. Now they're going to try to estimate them in to inflate the numbers. They're just going to set them up for a bigger fail next year unless they keep estimating more and more people are at bars. I would like them to release those numbers which because I couldn't get a clear count on where their numbers came from. How many did they think were at the bars? Because that's interesting to me that they just thought, you know what, that's what happened. Everyone went to the bars last year. That's why we're 1% off. Like, look at the numbers. Whoever pitched that idea is a genius because he just sold it to a ton of executives who love it and then are going to try to pitch that to advertisers. It's false hope. Uh, but anything, uh, Matt, you can go ahead and get into it. Anything you want to talk about the NFL? Well, one of the things that, that you'd brought up as far as the statistics, I know – at different points, me and you have argued over stuff. We always, and I always say that you can make those statistics go any way you want it to be. You can you can prove your point or disprove your point based off of what stats you want to pull into it. And I think this is just another one of those examples of trying to use those stats to inflate numbers or to try to cover up the fact that there isn't issues going on with the protests and different things that are going on. To me, one of the things that that looking at this year. You see the move from the Raiders going out, eventually moving out to Vegas. And you see the teams playing in, a, in a L.A. And I, I understand the initial idea of having one team there, but I, I still, going back to some previous conversations, don't understand the logic in putting a second team in a place that historically has kind of struggle, struggled to fill, where I don't, I don't think that it wouldn't have mattered which franchise you take out of their home stadium and place them there i don't know that they're they have the following in the success and i would even use the stillers as an example if you were to take them out of pittsburgh and move them into la i don't know that they're going to be on that level of success one of the other things that i'm related to that that i that stood out to me was uh during the, the Pittsburgh game against the Ravens, Antonio Brown threw a little bit of a temper tantrum on the sidelines. Really aggravated me. I just I saw with, that with all of his all of his showboating and different stuff. I I understand where his frustration is with not getting his touches and not getting his opportunities because maybe that realization is hitting that Ben Roethlisberger isn't playing forever, and he's only as good as Ben Roethlisberger is because it's not like when a backup quarterback goes in, that he continues to put up the numbers that he does. You know, I can understand if he's continuing to put that kind of stuff up, if there's other people there. But it seems like because Ben has the arm strength to chuck it up for him, he really stands out and is able to get his statistics and make his money. And maybe he's realizing that that, that his opportunities for that big payday contract are going to soon be drying up if he doesn't start getting those opportunities soon. So... To me, I, I just kind of thought it's, it's an unnecessary move to throw that kind of tantrum on the sideline. You're a professional athlete and something that, that even on, on a very low level, I tell the high school kids I coach, be careful of what you're doing when there's – because you never know who's watching you and who's looking up to you. It's the same thing on a much, much bigger stage. They see him carrying on and then it, it allows – you know, college and high school and, and even youth league kids to think that it's okay to act that way. And, and 
there's no place for. Should just have he could have that conversation in the locker room. He could have a meltdown any other place. Don't do it on the sideline. Don't do it in front of a packed stadium. And definitely don't don't do it where you know there's going to be TV that's going to paint you in the wrong picture. Yeah, I actually had that written down. I'm glad you brought it up because it went along with something else that pissed me off. I understand that he gets mad in the game. You might get heated. But when you're throwing a temper tantrum, you're how old? You're in your 20s, maybe 30s if you're an NFL player. You know how to control yourself. A lot of these people, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose for show because they're like, well, I'm not going to get my way. I'll throw a temper tantrum. Maybe they'll get some pressure from the ownership if they see me doing this or someone else in the organization is going to come to bat for me because they see that I'm outspoken. Maybe it was his way of, of being a leader. I don't know, but you're right. There's no place for it on the sideline. I think it's only going to add to more locker room woes. I've been worried about it since what happened last week. Uh, there's been some chatter about it. I mean, you lose to the Bears. Something's going on, especially now because I'm looking at looking at the Ravens. I thought it was going to be Steelers-Ravens. Steelers haven't beat the Ravens at home since 2012. That's like five years. I'm pretty sure that was a stat. It could be longer uh, because I can't read my own writing when I'm scribbling stuff down. But they were out there, and I assume these were the top two teams. So for them to lose at home, as, as bad as they did, it just it was baffling to me. Are the Steelers that good, or is the a AFC North that bad? And building on that, the AFC North has had, I think they said another number I can't read, seven of the last eight to 10, 12 years have, have had two teams represent the AFC North in the playoffs. I don't know if that's going to continue this year. But that just shows how dominant the Ravens and Steelers and Bengals, to a lesser extent, have been. And the Browns have not. I don't think they've had any of those playoff spots. So you're looking at this matchup. It was a premier matchup. I was excited about it. And the Steelers just took them to the woodshed. I understand the Ravens have troubles, but I was encouraged by that game. And my last thing, the thing that pissed me off that I mentioned, is the announcers for the game. I can't take it. I finally, college, I don't have a problem with college. It seems like they're giving in interest. They're giving like a little bit of, of stats and things. They're interested in the game. NFL guys, it's kind of like they don't know what's going on. The thing that really got me is they kept referring to Antonio Brown as Antonio Bryant. And I don't know if it was he was confusing them, combining names, but he's like, ah, oh, yeah, Antonio Bryant, he's so great out here. And I was like, thinking, all right, someone's going to correct him. Someone's going to get in his earpiece and correct him and tell him. And they go ahead. Uh, Bryant makes a catch. And he's like, oh, yeah, and, uh, there he is. And he's going to add some some other uh, receptions for the Steelers on opposite of the side of Antonio Bryant. And I was like, you had, didn't realize, I don't know what you're doing here, bro. But you're not saying the name correctly. It's making me mad because – I, there was a receiver, Antonio Bryant. I'm pretty sure there was. So maybe that's where he's coming from. But mute. And I'll tell you, the rest of the weekend games were much better that way. And it's only the NFL that it bothers me on. It's like they're talking about random things. They were they spent – what game was that? Was it uh, – I don't even know. One of the NFL games, someone had – became a father for the first time. They talked about it for 15 minutes. 15 minutes about how his wife was in labor for 30-something hours. I don't want to hear about someone going through labor and the pains of that while I'm trying to watch football. That has nothing to do with the game. It, I was so frustrated. I forget what the – I had two games on it. It was Steelers and that. I have my dual TV set up. It's awesome. Highly recommend it. You can kind of go back and forth. But, but I don't want to be muting one TV, putting up sound on the other to hear about someone's labor pains because – it's the quarterback's wife, and he had his first son. Actually, I think it was the Redskins game. Was it uh, – what's their quarterback's? Cousins. Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins. I think it was Kirk Cousins. They talked about his wife's pregnancy for a good 15 minutes of that game. And I was like, what are you doing? You want me to turn the game off? I'll, I'll turn it off if that's what you're trying to do because that doesn't add anything to the game. I don't know if you guys heard that, what your thoughts are. 
Uh, but I'll let you you talk, Rick. I don't want to take all the time up. What are your thoughts on the NFL this week? Uh, I think the AFC is, is a bunch of teams that are right now battling each other in a way. If you look at the standings, there's not even a team with a winning record in the South. There's only one in the North currently, one in the East, and two in the West. It's a lot of teams that are all in the middle part. And what the heck happened to the New England Patriots who are now 2-2? Two and two? A lot of people picked them to win the Super Bowl, and their defense looks horrible, absolutely horrible. So I know they're going to play a lot more interdivision games. They haven't played one yet. So they still have two Miami, two Jet games, two Buffalo games. You know Buffalo looks good this year. So, I mean, that'll help them out in a way. Just like the Steelers can help out because they play two games against Buffalo, or two games against Cincinnati, two games against Cleveland and everything like that. I just think it's a lot of mediocre teams or teams that are all in the middle fighting each other. And there are teams that are clearly cellar dwellers. Chargers, Browns, Jets will eventually be when they start losing some more games. So, but there's just, it's a lot of mediocre teams and everything. And I think one, two reasons you can look at it is that there are, have been some injuries. God guys are being doubtful or questionable this week. This week, um, some teams will hit the bye week. And then also, uh, preseason was a pretty much a joke. It was pretty much, let's throw the backups out there and see how well they do. So, I mean, as and I mean, there's another reason if you want to say, why not to watch the NFL? The NFL preseason was pretty much a joke. You could watch three or four snaps. And you're like, okay, all the starters are gone. I don't know any of these guys with names. Let's see what else is on TV. I mean, even Monday night for me, I was watching the game, got bored, and then I turned it on a Law & Order rerun that I never saw and watched that, and I thought it was more interesting than the Monday night football game at one point, You know, especially when Kansas City was doing nothing in the second quarter. So for a second quarter and halftime, I watched Law & Order reruns. So, I mean, it's just you got to be interesting. you got to care. You can't bore the people to death. I know you talked about awful announcing. I mean, that's why I don't watch pirate games because I have the tendency to fall asleep during them. So, and then I turn it on to San Diego Padre games or something along those lines just because I like hearing their announcers and they're actually interesting and will actually tell you about the game. Even though the San Diego Padres aren't a good team, but at least you can watch the game and have fun and then you get to see the West Coast games you never get to see. Yeah, I agree. A lot of trash out there. We had a comment that there are a lot of bad quarterbacks in the league. I actually joked with you guys during the game about is someone was saying that they should uh, put in McGloin at quarterback, and I was asking how bad, how many trash quarterbacks do you want in the league? You want Penn State to have another garbage quarterback? He was he wasn't even good at Penn State, yet he's in the NFL. And then NC State's doing the same thing. They're putting guys in there. They've been bragging about having four guys in the league when the guy is Mike Glennon. And he's playing awful. It's like you're watching the, the teams play. He's been demoted. Well, of course he's been. The Bear, they're they're playing the, Trubisky. The right? Bears just announced that Trubisky's going to get the start. He, he can't do any worse. And the Bears, I don't know. I, I haven't been high on Trubisky. I actually was doing some more research. He, I didn't realize he was only six foot two inches tall. I've seen some reports saying that he has the intangibles like Ben Roethlisberger. The thing that makes Ben Roethlisberger good is he can absorb the hits. As crappy as the Steelers' line has been, he gets hit a lot. Whenever you're smaller, whenever Trubisky's two, in, two three inches shorter, 20 pounds lighter, you're not going to take those hits. I mean, you've seen it with countless guys, uh, Robert Griffin the third. Whatever happened to him? You start to get a pounding because the line's awful. Get shipped to another team. Same thing happens. You get banged up can't play at top speed, once you lose that edge, you're used to outrunning guys, once you get banged up a little bit, you're going to lose some top end speed, you're out of the league. I've seen some things too with like, uh, is it EJ Manuel? He's out there with Oakland now. Bad break for Derek Carr. And I think I saw something where they said, I think actually our friend Mike, he sent it out that Derek Carr and Mariota got injured the same day the past two years. So they got injured on the exact same day, which is which is crazy. And I think he has broken vertebrae. And they were saying he might only be out for two weeks. How do you come back from a broken vertebrae on two weeks? I feel like if he has family, the family should be like, you need to you need to rest a little bit more. 
I, I don't know if the Raiders are going to win the division with the way the Chiefs have been playing, so they might need him back sooner rather than later. But at some point, you've got to put your health first. A broken back is a broken back. That, that's pretty serious, I would say. Uh, Matt, what are you thinking? Well, you were saying about the Raiders, and actually, I was thinking about the Chiefs. And for as much as we've we've trash talked Andy Reid, as of right now, he's looking like a rocket scientist, letting Alex Smith run the same offense that he was running in Utah in the NFL with so many shovel passes and read options. It's like he must have went to the Urban Meyer school of of short game because. The same exact stuff that made him an over number one overall pick is the same kind of stuff that he's doing now with the Chiefs. And they're, you know, I, I look at it and they're taking the things that he can do and they're tailoring the offense around it. Now I don't know if he were to get injured, if they would still be able to do the same kind of things with their backup quarterbacks. But I think at least it, it shows a sense of savvy on Andy Reid's part to take the skill set that Alex Smith has and allow him. The, the option to run a little bit, get involved with the running game, use more bootlegs to open up some of the other stuff. The, the, their offense is really clicking right now, making teams not be able just to sit in a matchup quarters coverage and kind of make them nickel and dime it down the field. I was also – like with the Pittsburgh Steelers game, I also kind of thought when, when we're watching those games – they never truly, like the final score, 26-9, showed that, that it was a decisive win. But you never actually get that feeling anymore that they truly put a team away. It's always like you hold your breath and wait for them to fumble it, interception, whatever, to let the, let the other team back in the game. Like The worst thing that, that I think can happen watching Pittsburgh play anymore is letting them get up two or three scores on a team. Because then it's like rather than – than putting the dagger in their heart and just finishing them off. They decide to just like do really crazy things. Like they'll throw the ball every single play and end up with like four or five interceptions or fumbles or crazy things that then let the other team back in the game. And it's like, you got to hope that they do enough to hold on for the win. I was glad to see that the final score, you know, showed them taking the steps in the right direction, but see it on a more consistent basis because they have the continuity in the coaching staff. And for the most part, the player development, they just need to put the product on the field. Well, the Steelers problem has always been, they kind of got away from their identity. They can't run the ball. So now they have a garbage O-line pretty much for the past, it seems like seven, ten years. It, like that long, they've been not able to run the ball consistently. I, I think the last guy was a Willie Parker. Well, see, the last one has been able to actually get yards on the ground. I know Bell does his, his job, but he does a lot of more zone reads, and they get him the ball out of the backfield where they're not able to just power, run, and put a team away. And that's why I think Willie Parker stands out to me because he was more of a speed guy, but he was small enough where he was compact enough to take those hits. And when the Steelers needed him to salt the game away, they can do it. Now, you're right. They don't. They get, for some reason, Ben Roethlisberger's throwing the ball. They get sloppy because they feel like they probably relax, think, okay, we have a lead. Guy's not concentrating, drops the ball. Guys on the sidelines throwing tantrums, gets some, a little bit. Maybe he doesn't give it 100%. The old Randy Moss where he takes a couple plays off, throws an interception, tips the ball. It, it just – they don't have that, okay, we're going to crush you, that mentality. I think it's kind of like Mike Tomlin's – he's laid back. He's going to do the thing. I know the things that kind of annoys me whenever he's coaching where he's on the sideline. He's not as bad as where Dave Wanstad at Pitt would like comb his hair – or play with his mustache or whatever he was doing as they were getting the ball run down their throats. But it's frustrating enough where I think it's kind of just a culture. They're going to win a lot of the games because they don't have a competition. And like you said, the middle might be that bad where they're just beating the other teams up. And this, maybe the Steelers aren't even that good. Maybe they only have eight wins this year. Maybe they only have nine wins. I don't know. When you're losing to teams like the Bears, the jury's not out on that. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but the Chiefs, they have that where they're able to just run. I don't know if Washington's that good or if the Chiefs just struggled with them. But overall, I think the Chiefs are the most solid team in the league. And speaking of, I think someone mentioned the Patriots. I think Rick did. 
Have you guys ever heard of uh, Jeff Sargarian or Sagarin? Whatever the uh, Sagarin, he does the, I think it's USA Today, he does weighted statistics. But I've had people send them to me whenever we talk about college teams. They're like, well, look, you're wrong because Sagarin puts out his rankings and he, he does his own computer rankings. I actually think they were used in the BCS. He still has the Patriots as the number one team in the league. They have looked bad. There's no way they're the number one team. Maybe top 10 just based on coaching and Tom Brady. But the stats say otherwise. So I would like him to release his formula finally. Because I know he always overweights some teams in college football more than others. And it's a hidden formula that he charges USA Today or whatever to use. or And the BCS or whatever. But just looking at that today when I, someone was saying the Patriots are still the best team in the league. Right now... The only team you can actually say that for is possibly the Chiefs just because they're most consistent. I don't see any other team that's been head and shoulders above other teams. Everyone else is kind of – the way they shut out the Patriots, I know they struggle with Washington. Maybe Washington's just good. Maybe they're going to win the NFC East. Them or the Eagles right now look like they're it. Giants look like garbage. The Cowboys, they're, they're going through their own sophomore slump. You knew it was going to happen when it, with Zeke and everything. That team wasn't going to – we thought they were going to go high, but I thought that was just based on the weakness of the NFC East. Um, but any final thoughts on the NFL before we move on to college football? Um, Matt, we'll just keep going in the same direction. What do you think? No, I don't really have a whole lot. I, mean, I would think we, we covered the majority. I was surprised. Uh, that AFC whatever, w- w- that the Bills are now one of the teams that are competing after really thinking that trading away all their players were going to bottom out and be starting from scratch. It's interesting to see in the early part of the year that they're actually in lead and first. They're one of the teams battling for first place and are holding their own in that division. Yeah, the Bills, I think we, I think we argued about that because I didn't think they were actually trading pieces away. I thought they were trying to shore up their defense when they got those cornerbacks or whatever they, they traded. I think they got Watkins for a cornerback. And now that defense is like the number one defense in the league or at least close to it. On I, on offense, I think the thing that really hurt was when Bolden didn't show up or he retired. Because just think if they had that extra weapon. I know he's a veteran, but look at Larry Fitzgerald. He's playing at a high level. Bolden's younger than him. So he could still get the job done. Any final thoughts for you, Rick? Brandon Whedon just got signed by the Titans. So if you're looking for journeyman quarterbacks, you've got Matt Castle and Brandon Whedon this weekend, probably for the Tennessee Titans. Congratulations. They're old. Brandon Whedon used to be a minor league prospect for the Yankees, too, at one point. So I have a Yankees card of him. His rookie card is not going to be worth anything. So so good luck to the Tennessee Titans this weekend. you got a guy who was a bust a couple of different places and a former Yankee pitcher, minor leaguer, who was a bust in the minors for them and a bust for Cleveland. First round pick, too. Yeah, he was old when he came out of Oklahoma State. I don't think a lot of people realize that because I think he did he go the MLB route first. He went the MLB route first and he made it to like high A and didn't. That was it. So as a pitcher, didn't pan out. He was like Chris Winky. He was. Very. That's a very good example. He was Chris Winky. Speaking of that, Matt, who would you say is the best Florida State NFL quarterback? Is it Jameis Winston all time? Have they had any that I that I'm missing here? As as of right now, I would. Danny Cannell was serviceable, but probably Jameis Winston as of right now. I know someone actually commented that we should get try to get Danny Cannell to give thoughts on our show. But I was thinking, we already have enough Florida State talk. We don't need another Florida State guy here. Yeah, why would we want people with expert knowledge? <laughs> hey, I, we, we would ask for someone from Michigan, but ESPN already signed them all for coverage. So I, I know, that's we, what we I was, don't have any more spots now. That's what I was going to say. Now it doesn't matter what channel I turn on, ESPN, Monday Night Football. Hey, Charles Listen's on here. Uh, what was the other one? I turn on college football. Hey, Desmond Howard's here. I turn on TNT coverage. Hey, it's uh, Chris Weber. I go to ABC. Hey, it's Jalen Rose. They're everywhere. It's awesome, and I, it's very comforting. And that way I know, hey, at least one of these guys 
knows what they're talking about on the show. Because I, I talked about the wrong, the thing. Uh, which reminds me, also on the show last night, when I talked about uh, the commentators, it was John Gruden. He was like bailing his brother out. He kept saying, hey, yeah, my brother, uh, he's down there. He's doing a good job. It might not look like it, but he was like th- saying things like that. Like, uh, they're struggling right now. They just don't have the players. It was kind of like, John, are you going to give me thoughts on the game? Or are you giving me excuses on why your brother is about to lose this game? Because that's what it felt like to me. Because uh, I turned it back on because I was doing something. I was like, I'll just turn it back on to kind of hear what's happening. Because it was a good game. And that's what was happening. J- John Gruden was kind of like trying to bail his brother out. So I thought that was very disappointing. Uh, whenever you're whenever you're commentating the game and you keep saying things like, uh, yeah, yeah, my brother, my brother Jay down there. He just doesn't have enough running backs on his team, or whatever he was, whatever point he was trying to make. Um, I just didn't get get it. Uh, but he did mention Andy Reid, and I know I've been tough on him. And maybe this year he'll finally prove me wrong. I mean, I would like to see him because you see a lot of teams that get rid of coaches, especially in college, which is what I'm gonna, I'm going to lead off with here. So there is a point where I'm going. But Andy Reid's been a head coach for however many years. If he finally gets to the hump. Maybe it'll kind of curtail some of these teams that seem to fire coaches every two or three years. And that's a, that's a trend in college football. You keep rebuilding, you keep rebuilding. You're not giving guys enough time to build a core, get people to buy in, get new recruiting classes, especially in college. And the NFL, it's a little bit different. But if you start to build that culture up, I think of Bill Cowell. How many times did people call for his head in the 90s for almost getting the job done? They kept get they stuck with them, stuck with them. Yeah, maybe they could have took a gamble and, and hired a young coach that might have got two or three more Super Bowl wins. But Bill Cowher finally won one. And I'll be honest, it would be nice to see Andy Reid. If the Steelers can't win it, I would like to see Andy Reid pick one up. I know I'm tough on him. Uh, but I do notice he's still he's still old school. He has that huge card. John Gruden talked about it. He said that the card looks like it's grown this year, where he has all the crazy plays, probably all the screen plays he puts on there. Uh, but he has it on the sideline. His own playbook right there, old school. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not holding up random cards, going from head. Uh, so I'm pulling for him if the Chiefs are going to get it done. And it would be good to see Alex Smith get it done too. Because when he was at college, he was lights out. There was big debate between him and Aaron Rodgers. Wouldn't it be crazy if at the end of the year, Aaron Rodgers and Alex Smith both have the same amount of Super Bowl wins? One. Almost, was it a decade now? They've been in the league for about 10 years, I think. That would, it would blow everyone's mind because of how high everyone talks on Aaron Rodgers. I know it has to drive Alex Smith. And, he, and you're right, Matt. He, he looks like he's much better. And I already switched the topic to college football. I don't know why I keep talking about the NFL. Uh, but where I was going with that is LSU. LSU lost to Troy. They pushed out my boy Les Miles. I thought it was a bad decision to begin with. I didn't know what they were doing. And they hire Ed Orgeron. Awful decision. He was awful. He was head coach at Ole Miss. He was awful. Some guys just aren't good head coaches. They're great position coaches. I, I think I look at Brady Hoke at Michigan. Great position coach. Uh, he knows what he's doing. Good recruiter. Can get the job done. Some people just can't handle the day-to-day operations. You kind of have to have that CEO mindset. I don't think Ed Orgeron has that. He might be great motivator. Might be a great recruiter, might be a great position coach, but when you put it all together, you saw at USC he was able to rally the guys when he took over as interim. I believe that's where he was. And I think they ultimately hired Steve Sarkeesian. I could be wrong. I shouldn't be saying stuff because I'll just have all my facts mixed up. But he was there. I think they won out. Some people were saying, oh, USC should hire him. USC should hire him. But they saw what I saw. He's a, he's, a good rec- he's a good recruiter. He can get the troops fired up. But once he's in charge, he just doesn't have it. So I'm looking at LSU right now. They're in the same position as Nebraska. You go ahead. You fire a guy that's consistently getting you wins. Yeah, he might not get you to the top. Uh, but Bo Pelini, I've mentioned him on the show before. He was getting Nebraska nine wins at a time. They fire their AD. They bring in a new AD. Is, who's Nebraska going to get now? I've actually seen some things mentioned where they should go back to their roots and try to run some type of new age shotgun option, which probably would be the best route. Go something kind of like what Oregon did with the shuttle passes 
and the 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 read option run. I think Nebraska could be pretty good with that, especially if they go back to what they used to do, where they would have high school programs run the same exact offense. That way, you're recruiting the bigger guys you pull from out of state, but every single team in your state runs the same offense that you're running at Nebraska. So when you're picking up walk-ons and three-star guys, you can backfill like Wisconsin does. Wisconsin does the same thing in basketball that they do in football. Every high school team runs the same exact system. People call their basketball system boring. They run sets. They they play physical. Every team in that state in high school runs that offense in high school basketball. Something similar for football. And then even the teams that run eight-man, they run a variation of that same offense. So when Wisconsin is looking for recruits, they can't pull guys from L.A. or from Florida all the time. They can get one or two, and then they backfill with in-state guys that they're able to get who are familiar with their system and can come in and contribute right away. A lot of Wisconsin guys, if you look at those big linemen that they put in the NFL, a lot of them were quarterbacks in high school. Six foot five guys that play quarterback, they bulk them up. They redshirt them. They don't play till they're juniors. That's what Nebraska needs to do. LSU is kind of in a different situation. What, what, are, what are their options? They push him out. They try to bring someone else in. I've seen them, and, and uh, the, the other place he was mentioned was Tennessee, Chip Kelly. If you go ahead and, and push out Ed Orgeron or you, you're Tennessee and you bring in Chip Kelly, either of those programs, I'll use them interchangeably here. You can even throw in Nebraska. You're going to bring a guy who, who has a totally different system, bring it into power, southern football. That's going to take years to implement. You haven't been patient with your current coaches. How is it going to work out? You have to give them time to build up a system. You have to get the high schools to buy in. You have to get the recruits to buy in. You have to have that base. And that's what I'm looking at here. I know it's early in the college football season. But Tennessee, they look like they're a lame lame duck program right now. Same with LSU. They're going down that route. I know it's still early. Uh, What are you guys' thoughts on – I know, Matt, you're a coach, so I want to get you to go first here. What are your thoughts on – helping a program build a system, and how many years do you think a head coach should get before he starts to guilt, feel the heat? Because like the same guys, it's the same programs every couple of years it feels like when you're feeling the heat. And I, it can't be good for winning. You're not going to be able to build that program. So go ahead. Well, I, I think it depends on what type of program you're going to do and what kind of system you're going to bring with you. I think you could look at someone like Nick Saban, who right now is winning at Alabama like crazy. I think you could he could leave there, and he could go to just about any program as long as he has a long enough leash and the fan base doesn't run him out, and he can eventually make them successful. Another piece that a lot of times you don't really talk about is what's the buy-in on the kid side? If the kids go, when you bring in a new coach, are they accepting of what you're trying to bring out? Because you may have the best offense or the best defense of mind, but if the kids don't understand or they don't buy into what you're doing, then you're constantly going to be fighting to try to get the people that you need to make your system work. You know, if you're a spread type offense, for example, and you need that running mobile quarterback, and, and I'll use Oregon as an example. Their offense was very high tempo, very fast moving, scored a lot of points with Marcus. After he graduated, they weren't able to replace that talent of a player. And they weren't able to build it around the quarterbacks that they had. And and you saw the struggles then of that program. They couldn't compensate for some of those other positions. So I think if you can if you can recruit and build around what your quarterback is or your running back, then you have the opportunity maybe to make that happen. You know, one of the things that I saw in the LSU game and was kind of doing a little bit of reading, one of the things that I had heard just looking at different things online is that Ogeron was handcuffing Matt Canada. As he came over from Pitt, one of the things that made his offense go is multiple shifts, multiple motions, multiple personnel groupings. And what he would try to do is just use his motions and trades to try to get you to miss a line. And after you miss a line, would take advantage of the big plays. Well, if he's not allowed and he's being handcuffed by his head coach, 
that can really make things difficult if you're if you're basing a lot of your calls off of I want to see how the defense is going to react and what coverage they're going to be in in certain situations. If you don't have or if you're not allowed to run the plays that are going to set up the knockout punch, then it, it makes you very one-dimensional and it leads to some of the same things that that you see over and over again with the LSU program. One of the advantages that they have in particular is they don't have another power school to fight with recruits. So the in-house kids in Louisiana, the main draw is LSU. You know, yes, there are other schools, but they don't have the big name run that that LSU brings to the table. Like if you look at Texas, you could have you look at the University of Texas, Texas Tech, you know, Texas A and M, all those all those programs within there, SMU, that that are going to make each other. They're gonna Right with the frozen state recruits, LSU doesn't have that issue. Wisconsin doesn't have that issue. They they can keep at least the kids within their own state there, and I think that that's something that that is an advantage when you're trying to build your program because you can really set up. You know, looking at how Miami is able to rope off that Miami area when they're playing very good football, and they don't allow a lot of those South Florida recruits to leave. It, it sets the table for very, very tough recruiting because they keep those local kids at home. Rick, do you have any thoughts on this? My thoughts are more about LSU and the future in the next upcoming weeks. Here are their teams. October 7th, they got Florida. October 14th, Auburn. November 4th, Alabama. So three out of your four next weeks, you're playing Florida. In Alabama. And here's the good part. You get to go to Alabama and you get to go to Florida. Auburn has to come to you. So I would say out of those next four weeks, those are three guaranteed losses. And if they pull one out somehow, congratulations. But I don't see it happening. You got Mississippi in between. That, you flip a coin. I think that would go either way. So you could possibly, at best, you can get two wins. But realistically, maybe you only get one. I mean, LSU, I didn't understand the Les Miles firing. Still will never understand it. Um, if you think that you should win the national championship every year, it doesn't happen. Not unless you're Alabama in the recent years. It's not been happening. And, I mean, it's a dream sequence to do it. I don't know what type of fairy tale lives these uh, athletic directors live. I don't know if they just prance around their houses and think they're the greatest thing ever, you know, and just tweet in their head. It's not happening, and I don't get it. I understand you want the big money, the big games, but if you're going to have constant turnover at your coaching, head coaching job, you're not going to get it because your recruits are going to be like, this guy's only here for three years, where Nick Saban, he pretty much has a job locked up until he retires. James Franklin locked up until he retires. Even Harbaugh, you could even say for a certain extent. It's either he retires from that job or he's going to the NFL. And if he's going to the NFL, he could take me along with him eventually when I go to the NFL. See Chip Kelly in his way that he worked it. So may have lost him his job doing that too. But some guys got to continue an NFL career out of that. So I, I don't get it. I think LSU deserves what they get. If you want to fire a coach and have a terrible record, you're three and two now. You'll probably have a losing record by the beginning of November. Congratulations to you, but it doesn't make any sense. And especially losing to Troy, that's embarrassing. And they were pretty much celebrating on the sidelines, which I thought was kind of good for them. Troy deserved to celebrate. They beat a NAC top twenty-five team, and LSU just looked like they were all out of sorts there. Yeah, and I've been saying it. LSU has been way overrated. So has Mississippi State, and we saw that whenever uh, they got taken to the woodshed by Auburn. The, the SEC West is really only Auburn and Alabama. It's been trending that way for the past couple of years. I even, I could even say back to the Cam Newton years. LSU has been – they've been competitive when they had less smiles, but once you get rid of Ham, they, they drop out of that third spot, and then I don't even think there is a third team. Ole Miss, whenever they're paying players and whatever else they're doing – They've fallen off now. So A&M, maybe. Maybe that third team now is Texas A&M. But that meltdown early in the year where they lost that game, I think it was UCLA, 
that really hurts them coming back into uh, these later later weeks in the season because now they have an out of, out of conference loss that's going to be stacked up and used against them, especially whenever UCLA probably isn't that good anyway. Now, the reason I brought up the coaches and how long they should be there is I've been looking at the way Clemson's been playing, and they've been playing pretty lights out. Dabo Sweeney, if you remember, he was, he's been at Clemson for a while now. He was there whenever they were playing uh, Steve Spurrier was at USC. They played Steve Spurrier uh, Gamecocks, and Clemson never really lost to them. And when Dabo first started there, I think the head ball coach had – three, four wins in a row, he was reeling them off. People in Clemson were saying that they like they were ready to push him out. They'll probably deny it now that he's won a national championship, but they were not high on Dabo. We made the wrong hire. We should do this. Maybe we should promote Chad Morris. I think Chad Morris was the OC. I think he's now at SMU. Um, but you have a situation where yep. the AD stuck with them. The program, the boosters were like, no, no, let's give our guy some time. Help him build some build a culture. Help him build uh, a program that's going to go ahead and get assistants, uh, big time jobs. Let them get head coaching jobs like he did with Chad Morris. Then he can recruit other great assistants to help elevate the program. Maybe some of those top recruiters that you see going around, uh, very similar to like the fast way that Harbaugh did it, hiring Don Brown. We talked about how good Don Brown has been. Dabo's now he's in a position where he can go ahead and, and do that. He can name assistants at these other schools. Like, hey, maybe you should come coach for me. I'll let you do whatever you want to do. I'll handle the program itself. I'll make the final decisions. That's where I don't think Ed Orgeron has that. So for LSU to go ahead and hire him, instead of trying to get a younger guy, trying to find their Dabo Swinney, someone that they can go ahead, build the culture around, build the program around, and then elevate it. I look at what Oklahoma did and what they've been doing with Lincoln Riley. Same exact thing. Lincoln Riley, I'm pretty sure, was at East Carolina back when they were good and they were beating the ranked teams, Virginia Tech, beating West Virginia, all those teams. Uh, I think that that happened like a couple years uh, back then. But he was a coach. He was a big, big time staff member. And everyone was saying that they should be the head coach somewhere. He goes ahead. He's, he keeps moving up the chain, moving up the chain. Oklahoma likes him enough. Bob Stoops likes him enough that they can go ahead and then they groom him. Okay, this is what you need to do as a head coach. You need to do these for the program. This is how we do it here at Oklahoma. So he's basically a built-in Dabo Sweeney. Is it going to pay off for them? I don't know. But I look at Oklahoma now and they're in a much better situation than these other programs who are hiring old coaches like Orgeron that, that have had their chance and failed. I mean, it's very rare that you're going to get an old coach that's failed to come in and resurrect your program. And I look at Nebraska the same way. They did the same exact thing. You had a guy, Mike Riley, who's had great years at Oregon State, but his great years came 10 years ago. I mean, he was coming off a losing campaign. I'm pretty sure when Nebraska hired him, he was coming off a 5-7 and seven season. And then they go ahead and think he's going to revive the program. You basically just set your program back three years. You're better off trying to build someone with an identity, getting one of your younger guys. The name I keep hearing with Nebraska is Scott Frost. He was their old quarterback back in the 90s. I think he was he the guy that cried uh, like on national championship, begging for them to give the coaching national championship to him in 97 against Michigan, begging for it for Tom Osborne because he needs it, because he's going to go out on top or whatever uh, his whiny speech was. I'm pretty sure that's the guy. Uh, I forget where he's coaching now, but Nebraska really wants to bring him in because now they realize they just wasted a bunch of time. Where by hiring, a, it's kind of like we talked about with the NFL. You're recycling the same exact guys, except expecting better results, and it's not going to happen. So that's my rant on college football this past week. Matt, go ahead. Look like you're going to say something. Scott Frost is at UCF right now, and it's part of the reason why UCF is ranked in the top 25 right now and they're playing as well as they are because he was the offensive coordinator under chip kelly when they when they had mariota there and he took the he took it the job over at ucf and he has that program turned around i'm thinking because of how relatively new he is there they may want to give the coach at nebraska another year to let frost really show that he's the real deal 
at UCF and then be willing to give him that longer term extension. But I think you hit exactly on the one point that I was thinking about as far as how much leeway do you give a coach. If the athletic director does their due diligence and they sort through their applicants and they have the guy that they think is the man, they need to lock him up for a long-term deal and just let it go and let let the pieces fall because sometimes there's things outside of a coach's control like player injuries, different different things. You know, you, you get a turnover at the wrong time that, that just doesn't bounce your way. And just like how you talked about Bill Cowher and possibly him being run out earlier in his career, I think – it was for LSU. It was the right move to hire Ogeron, because of all the way that everything fell with Jimbo Fisher denying leaving Florida State to go there. You had Tom Herman, who was said that he was going to go there and then backed out. There was all these big name coaches that were supposedly linked to LSU, and nobody was going there. I think it left them with Ogeron to be the only person left that could still kind of bring some stability to the program because they were in the middle of the recruiting season. Had they have gone with someone completely different, it definitely could have impacted their recruiting class from this past year, having a lot of kids possibly transfer out or decommit and not want to go there with Ogeron. He provided the stability to allow them to continue going forward. Now, it's to be seen at this point whether he's going to be successful or not, but I think – if the school is willing to invest the money in facilities, it could possibly lead to paying dividends. I don't know exactly what the condition of LSU's like practice facilities and things like that are, but but I know with some of the other teams, that was one of the things that really helped Clemson. Is as Dabo Sweeney was uh, building Clemson, he was also getting renovations to to attract those top players because it seems like the arms race now to get recruits is not just being able to offer them a scholarship to a, a good school, a top 25 school. It's also, what are those extras? Like, what's what's your locker room like? What kind of extra things do you get as, for being part of that? And for the teams that are willing to spend the money and invest in it, it pays off in the long run because who wants to go to a crappy dungeon-like locker room when some of these teams like Texas is investing millions of dollars into brand new things that – you know, could be something that a recruit would be interested in. Yeah, I, I agree with some of those points. When I'm looking at it as a program, I know you, you said about Orgeron being the right hire for LSU at the time. I honestly think that they were forced to hire, hire him because they overvalued their program. I, I've mentioned this to you off, off the show before, but in college football, there's really only five programs that are the ones that can basically support themselves. It's Alabama, Texas, Ohio State, Michigan, and Notre Dame. Those are the top five dogs. They have the most wins. They have the biggest stadiums. They have basically everything. They can name their price. Maybe they don't have the best history, but if you look at Texas, they have the weight from the donor money, from the endowment, everything they have. They're able to support themselves. Those five schools... There are a couple handful of schools that are on that that are really close to that tier, uh, the Oklahomas, the USC's. Maybe you can even throw a Penn State in there, a hundred plus thousand stadium. And you have these schools like LSU, who have been hearing it from ESPN over the past ten years, that okay, they're historically a solid SEC team, but they're not. They don't have the branding that Alabama has. Alabama kind of carries the SEC. It's always kind of been that way, even in the '90s. LSU has, what, two national championships? I don't even know. I need to put together a list of, like, SEC national championships, and and then you'll start to see the stats. ESPN might push that LSU is this great program, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not a top dog. So they are thinking, okay, we can fire less miles, and we can pick our coach. You can't. You're not going to be able to pick your coach. You're LSU. I don't care if ESPN tells you that you can. You can't. That's why Tom Herman turns you down and goes to Texas. He goes to that top dog. That's why whenever you're looking at schools and they say, okay, well, so-and-so, uh, they were saying ESPN was pushing it out whenever Harbaugh was still at the 49ers. They were saying Harbaugh's not going to go to Michigan. He's out on the West Coast. The only schools he would, he would probably go to uh, a UCLA or someone. There was no way he's going to go to UCLA. UCLA is not even close to Michigan in football. Maybe USC, but he wouldn't even go there. So there are some programs like Urban Meyer. People are saying Urban Meyer, if you or Ohio State has a tough year, 
he could jump to another top program. He's already at the top. The only way he can jump is if he makes a lateral move. And where is he going to go? To Notre Dame? I know he used to work there. That would be the only place he could go. Because any other program is going to be a step down. And that's just the truth of it. And the reason I bring this up is we, I didn't mention it at the front of the show, but there's a huge investigation, and this is what I'm going to end on, in college basketball. Dealing with Adidas, I think Louisville was pretty much outed. They fired Rick Pitino, their basketball coach, amid allegations, and this isn't an NCAA investigation. The NCAA already had Louisville pinned and has already threatened to take away their national championship in 2013. This is an FBI investigation. And I'm kind of waiting to hear some more information, so I didn't want to get too into it on this show. It's probably going to lead next week or the week after if more information comes out. But the matter is, the FBI has actual bank records or traces that they were paying recruits hundreds of thousand dollars, six-figure salaries to sign with different schools. And it tracks down. There were a couple mentioned. I actually saw an article here because I'm in uh, the Raleigh area that they said one of the recruit or one of the assistant coaches and tagged or named, actually has ties to UNC, who also had another scandal. So it's not that far of a jump to look at the schools mentioned and say, okay, well, maybe that other school's in it. Uh, some of the schools that were mentioned, I think the guy currently works, there are four schools that the people currently work at. It was Auburn, Oklahoma State, USC, and I'm missing the fourth one. Arizona? Um, yeah, Arizona, you're right. So, and some of these guys... When the allegations took place, when the years, I think the Oklahoma State guy, he was at South Carolina. Then one of the other guys was at Louisville. So they, they're able to tie the programs based on when these – it wasn't something that just happened. These are payments over years as an FBI sting. Uh, they actually just subpoenaed some Nike records. So they're going to go ahead and pull Nike into this. And there's basically – I think I mentioned it before on the show. There's three major brand apparel – companies that pay for college athletics right now it's under armor adidas and nike and they're going to go ahead now and they're going to be pulled into this fbi investigation basically for basketball but the reason i bring it up is there could be some overflow into college football one thing that was eyebrow raising to me is under armor just paid like made usc ucla like the top paid school they've never been the top paid school that's the same thing that happened to Louisville. So I wonder, is this another thing where they're funneling money to UCLA or some of these other programs that don't bring in? When you don't sell at your stadium, you don't deserve a top apparel brand. Why would they go after UCLA whenever USC is right there? USC is a better program. UCLA's most of their basketball wins have been alleged to come during a cheating scandal that hasn't really been proven because it's happened 40 years ago. And it will never be proven. And some other coaches come out and swear that they were cheating back in those days when they won 10 championships in a row and haven't really won since. So something to keep an eye on. I uh, don't want to make the show go any longer. I think that's what I'm going to end on. Any uh, final thoughts for you guys? Rick, we'll start with you. A couple. I want to congratulate my York Revolution for winning the Atlantic League title in independent baseball. Congratulations those guys. Secondly, I also want to mention this story because it came up on minor league baseball today. Gentleman by the name of Bubba Derby, minor league prospect for the Brewers, was involved in the Las Vegas shooting. He was at the concert, took his nephew and his girlfriend, survived it. He is known as a hero now because he protected being a human shield for two females that were at the concert. He's been getting a lot of national interviews right now because of it. So sad instance, but good to see there are actually good people like him. And hopefully best of luck to him, him and his career as well. Major League Baseball playoffs are continuing. Yankees are beating the Twins currently as we speak. 7-4. Uh, to four. So currently hockey season begins. Penguins on the chance for the three-peat. A lot of good teams are out there. I would say it's going to be very, very tough for them to but very possible. And new team Vegas this year, so... NHL goes to Vegas, so NFL will be following them. So NHL beat NFL to something. Yep. Uh, with that, that is a very a tra tragedy. I, I didn't even bring it up at the beginning of the show. Uh, just crazy how something like that could just take over. And I go to a lot of concerts, so that hits home to me, even sporting events. 
I mean, they should have something in place, I would imagine, to check for weapons. I think most of them, even the the Steeler Stadium now has or has had like metal detectors. Every concert I usually go to has it. So it's very sad. I don't want to say that it's preventable, but I would like to see safety measures all around everything, sports, just to make it safer because as a, as a family man, I would hate to have that extend. I, I wish everyone had made it out of there okay, and hopefully the other people that are injured are able to pull through um, because it's sad hearing news like that. But any final thoughts for you on the show, Matt? Yeah, this is uh, the makeup week for Florida State Miami. So if the, if you know someone who's a Miami fan and talks about using their iPhone the last time that Florida State beat Miami, the iPhone actually was not invented the last time Florida State lost a road game at Miami. I'll jinx myself, and then when they when they get killed, I'll be I'll be back here next week shifting. We'll we'll see what what our defense. It fails to prepare for because Mark Rick's been running the same offense since he was the coordinator here back in the early 90s. So we'll see what we got in store. Hopefully the Knowles can pull out another win. Uh, Blackman and company come ready to play. Yeah, man, I was going to ask you, I was looking through the rankings. I saw four Florida teams are ranked. UCF, South Florida, Miami, Florida, and I didn't see the Knowles there. Well, like I told you before, I think with the slate that they have, and for as biased as some people think that the pools are, it doesn't make sense to put them in. I mean, when you're barely getting by against Wake Forest and you got to win late in the game with a with a deep pass, it doesn't look good. You still have Clemson on the schedule. You still you still got Miami this week. You still have Louisville that you don't have really have an answer to yet. There's no reason why they should have to why they should be ranked. You you start to win some of these other games and start doing it in a manner that is respectable for a top twenty five team, and I think that they can they can be put back into that and they can be quickly placed into that that ranking as they deserve it. But until then, I don't mind keep them out because until you start playing like a contending team, don't don't be in the running, don't be a pretender, just get it, earn it, and then. Let, let your record and results speak for itself at the end of the season. Yeah, I think everything will shake itself out. And if Florida State beats Miami this weekend, that's going to throw a pretty big wrench in that coastal division. I think Miami is the last undefeated team, if I'm correct. So that's really going to knock down if Clemson were to stumble and a couple of the other teams like Oklahoma, now that they have a championship game, Championship opponents might matter. So it'll be interesting to see this the first year where every conference has a conference championship game. And my final thought, I remembered mine. We talked about facilities, talked about spending all the money. I brought it up last week with Purdue. Turns out Wilton Spate uh, is going to be out for a few weeks. He did have what I assume is a neck injury. I hope there's no broken vertebrae similar to what Derek Carr had. And it really hurts me as a Michigan man to hear that Purdue didn't have the stuff on site. I don't think they gave him uh, even a neck brace or anything. So whenever you're a college kid, you have an injured neck and you can't take care of it with your facilities. Purdue, that's pathetic. You get $50 million a year from the, from the Big Ten itself. Only TV. I don't care if no one attends your games. That's To me, that's unexcusable to get a player hurt. Um, possible career ending. I don't want to speculate here because I've been hurt. Uh, a couple different things, but very disappointed in the way that was handled. And I feel really bad that that could possibly be the end of his career. And that maybe if there was some immediate aid, that wouldn't be the case on the field. So something the Big Ten definitely needs to look at. I mentioned it last week. I've had some people reach out to me saying sour grapes and stuff. But if you look at the facts here, basically possibly could ending ended someone's career. I never want to see that. Uh, but that's our final note. And also, if you're going to talk trash and you're going to come to me directly, call into the show. Come on to the show. We've been inviting people on to talk trash and then everyone disappears. So if you're going to talk trash, just come on the show. It's very easy. You can come on. You, you see the format. Obviously, you're listening. Some of the people, they message me about like things I've said like an hour into the show. So I know you're listening to the whole thing. Just come on. Leave a voicemail. Our number is 412 Three three zero one five one two. 
Again, that's 412-330-1512. Uh, look it up. I think it's on our website. We're, we're currently updating our website, uh, making it 100 times better. So call in. Leave some voicemails. And we have to be able to understand it because we've had some garbled mess. If your phone sucks, and maybe your point uh, needs to be made in a better way. You can even record it and email it to us at contact at southboundsports.com. We'll play it on the show. Get your point across. Come on. Uh, but don't just disappear because that's weak. And so hopefully you enjoy the show, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening.